All right, welcome back. In our last couple of videos, we've been talking about ultimate strength capacities and how I do analysis of beams and how I do um, design of beams, okay? And a lot of that hinged around being able to find the dimensions of the beam or finding some row or row minimum value uh, based on some tables that we were looking up, okay? But there's a whole lot more factors that we also kind of need to be aware of and in the back of our mind as we're doing a, you know, a real world design example. So this, this lesson is intended to kind of outline some of those other considerations, um, things such as, you know, concrete cover requirements or, you know, the, the bar spacing requirements. You'll notice in the last video that I was giving the, providing those dimensions or those values in, in that particular lesson. So I'm going to show you the ACI requirements for those because there's a reason that they do a lot of that stuff, and we'll talk about some of those. Um, we'll get into some of the rebar detailing requirements, um, and then I'll kind of wind up this lesson with kind of an unrelated topic that is um, dealing with kind of design procedures, design methodologies. You know, how do I solve for a particular item given that I have other uh, details of a beam at my disposal? And so it's kind of a kind of a um, not quite a flow chart, but it's basically kind of what mentally goes through my mind when I try to solve for uh, a design problem in an SRR type of beam, okay? And so with that, we'll get ourselves underway. Okay, so the first issue that we want to talk about is our concrete cover, okay? And basically, it is necessary to have concrete cover between the surface of the slab or beam and the reinforcing bars for four main, main reasons, okay? The first region is, is that clearly I need to be able to bond the reinforcement to the concrete. So I need, and I need to be able to bond it on all four sides. So that's one, that's one pretty important reason, okay? Um, we need something that will protect the reinforcement against corrosion. Now we talked about you know, the, the alkalinity in the concrete being a shield for the steel, but if I crack, then we have issues with corrosion, okay? And so the thinner the cover, the more likely a section is to crack or spall off or get damaged and be knocked off. So we wanna be able to protect against corrosion, okay? We also wanna um, provide some sort of cover because again, in our, our basic materials property, we said that concrete was a good insulator, okay? And then it provides you know, thermal protection against steel in the event of a fire. So, you know, we want to be able to protect this reinforcement from any strength loss due to overheating in case of fire. So that cover will serve that purpose as well. Okay. And then a fourth reason is that additional cover is sometimes provided on the top of beams or slabs, kind of as, you know, in a situation where I have, you know, abrasion possibilities, you know, caused by, you know, wear and tear or, you know, a vehicle moving back and forth across it, kind of scouring it down, okay, generally due to traffic. Um, so that basically what happens is that the recover will not uh, be reduced less than the amount that the ACI code requires. So maybe ACI requires an inch and a half of cover, you put three inches on it so that, you know, it wears down and then as it gets lower and lower, then I come back over and I can build it back up and I never fall under the ACI minimum. Okay, we do this a lot in like bridge decks and asphalt overlays and that kind of stuff. It's all kind of a strategy to kind of protect the beam underneath that's doing all the work. Okay, all right, so what we do for uh, clear cover, okay, the amount of clear cover that's required is based on ACI 20.6 with specified values found in this table that I've taken a snippet of. That's 20.6.1, 0.3.1, okay? So it's kind of, it's not too hard to read this table, but some of the, 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 the major parameter is, has to do with the exposure of the concrete, all right? So if I'm casting my beam or my slab or whatever my object is against, you know, permanently against the ground, okay, then my specified cover is three inches, all right? Because what happens is, is in like foundations or something, when I go to try to do it against the ground, it's not possible to make a perfectly straight hole, if you will, okay? It's always got, you know, due to shovels or equipment, it's always got some jaggedness associated with it. And so we don't want to you know, be trying to put a bar over near a valley uh, or something like that. So, so for that reason, we have to go to a little bit of a larger size. And so they require three inches whenever you're against the ground. Okay. If I'm exposed to weather or in contact with the ground, um, exposed to weather, then for bars that are number six through 18s, it's two inches. Okay. For any of the, and the smaller wires, the welded wire fabrics, or a, a number five bar and smaller, 
then we're allowed to go to one and a half inches. Okay, it becomes a lot smaller value. And this is one of the, you know, we talked earlier on about, you know, choosing bar sizes that were conducive. This is another pro to keeping your bar sizes small. I don't need as much cover, which can reduce your, your section sizes on, on those kind of things. Okay, this is for what would be exterior um, concrete. You know, it could be in a parking garage, it's exposed to the elements, you know, anywhere that the weather can get to it or, you know, more importantly, things like de-icing or things that could cause cor uh, corrosion if we started having cover problems. Okay, for cases where I'm not exposed to weather or not in contact with the ground, then we kind of play the same game and I can go all the way down to three quarters of an inch of cover, uh, although one and a half is generally more, more to my liking on this, okay. And, or if we're looking at you know stirrups or spirals or ties and columns, then I can also use one and a half inches. So this is a very important table, and this is where those requirements come from. So if it's not specified on a problem, this is the table that you come to. This is what ACI mandates. Now again, you can always go larger than that, but these are the minimums for, for those. So that's the first one. Okay, the second consideration that we have to think about then is the bar spacing, all right? Typically, we design a beam, it's not one bar, so we need to be figuring out what's my spacing need to be between bars and adjacent to each other in the same layer, okay? Now, what, the reason that spacing is an issue is that the arrangement of a bars within a beam must allow the following, that we have to have sufficient concrete on all sides of each bar to transfer, transfer forces into or out of the bars, meaning this is a, a fancy word of saying we need to protect the bond. Okay, that I don't overload the stresses in the area and, and break down the bond. And so we'll talk about some of those. Um, we need to provide sufficient space so that fresh concrete can be placed and compacted all around the bars, right? And this will feed off of kind of like your max aggregate size, right? If I have a three quarter inch, you know, aggregate particle and I put two bars at a half inch apart, there's no way that, bar, that, that aggregate is going to be able to get through there. And so you start getting voids. In there and so the spacing will be dictated by the max aggregate size of the mix okay and so that becomes a very important factor that's what the second one is saying okay and then the third one is a little lesser known one is that we need to provide sufficient space to allow a mechanical vibrator to be able to reach through to the bottom of the beam to be able to vibrate and compact the, the concrete in place All right so again I don't want too small of an area maybe I need you know an inch or two inches to be able to thread that needle down through the bottom so that it can do its job Okay, all right, so those are some of the things that we're thinking of. Now, the beam details that are related to, to spacings and dimensions and those kind of things are found, you know, they're kind of scattered throughout. For the beam, we have some details located in ACI 9.7, okay, which deals with the arrangement of bars in multiple layers. For actual rebar details, you're looking in Chapter 20 and Chapter 25, okay, over in 20.6 and 25.2. Now, what it kind of boils down to has to do with, you know, what do you do if you have an unusual number of bars? You know, say I, I have five bars that are needed, okay? What happens is, is that they're not going to allow you to do an arrangement that looks something kind of like that. One, this is very hard to construct, even with a stirrup, right? Normally what we like to do is we like to, you know, we have a stirrup and then I will tie these bars to the stirrup in order to be able to, you know, once it's, once it's in place, I can pull these guys out. Okay, so this is actually a more conducive arrangement because again, typically you have some sort of transverse steel that's coming around this and that we'll talk more about that when we get to shear analysis. But this becomes a lot easier to construct because otherwise if I the stirrup goes around the outside, how do you what are you hanging these two guys off of? How are you making those two being able to hold them at some spacing above the bottom layer? It becomes very very difficult. Now, you can take, you know, a jumper bar and just kind of use it to kind of build a bridge to help hold it up. But this becomes so much more simple if I can do that, all right? Okay, and, but what it, what it boils down to is that the provision ACI 25.2.2 basically says the bars must be vertically above or below bars of adjacent layers. So you can't have a staggered bar pattern on this. And that's, so that's the first one that we're looking at. Okay, the dimensional restrictions then look something kind of like this. Okay, and so what we have is, you know, for a general beam, so this is my stirrup. Okay, and then we have multiple layers of bars. We're going to look at what we call the clear spacing dimensions, okay? The vertical clear spacing dimension has to be at least one inch. Okay, although that same requirement of 1.33 times 
the, the maximum aggregate is a good rule of thumb to remember as well. Okay, the clear spacing between bars for the reasons that we talked about a rock getting in here and bridging over this, that requirement is set in 25.2.1. And what that requirement says is that it's the larger of three values. It's the larger of one inch, the diameter of the bar, okay, or 1.33 times the max aggregate size, you know, the diameter of the coarse aggregate. So that's a so that's a pretty pretty good provision. Okay, we've already talked about the cover requirements. There are actually two of them. The first one goes from the bottom edge of the stirrup down to the bottom edge. Okay, but then you also get into side cover, which is this guy, which would be from the outer edge of the bar out to the to the boundary of the beam. And that's on both sides. So I'm doing it on both sides. I'm doing it here and here as well. Okay, and so all of those will come out of 20.6.1. And that was that table that I showed you on on the previous page. So that's some of our some of our detailing issues. All right, so the way that I would kind of consider this on, you know, a work through for, you know, one of my class problems would look something kind of like this, okay? I call out side cover, bottom cover, there's this gap that occurs, okay, and then there's um, a horizontal clear spacing, okay? Because what happens is, and we haven't really talked about this, on a stirrup, you cannot do a 90 degree bend, okay? If I do that, I will break the bar at that outer corner and I will weaken the stirrups continuity. Okay, so what happens in reality is, is that there's provisions up in those rebar details that I showed. And again, I'm not gonna cover them here in which there has to be some sort of minimum radius for that bar to prevent us from damaging it. So there's not a square corner, it's a rounded corner. Well, if I try to take this bar and line him up so that he's all the way over, maybe this guy becomes a, you know, kind of a collision point on there. And so there's a little bit of a gap. You can kind of see it in that picture between the outer edge of this bar and the inside edge of the stirrup, okay? And I'm being, I can't get all the way over because of that gap distance. That's the gap that we're talking about. Now, like I say, for big bars on, you know, small stirrups, generally the gap distance is very small and a lot of times we just kind of neglect it and we don't worry too much about it. But it is an issue that they want to be kind of aware of as we look at it. Okay, so again, what I'll have them do is I will have them go through and figure out, well, what's my minimum cover for the bottom? What's my minimum cover for the side? That comes out of the tables that we showed you, okay? But the biggest challenge on this is, is that we have to be able to figure out what the centroid of the reinforcing pattern is, okay? And so what we can do is for this beam, I can kind of come in and figure out, you know, what are my, my minimum widths and my minimum dimensions associated with, with all of those, all right? So those are some, just a couple of a couple of little details that we'll kind of look at um, accordingly. Okay, so that's kind of the, the approach of what we're going to kind of look at for that. Now, one of the, the calculations that you kind of look at in this is, you know, once you find the depth on this, figuring out, you know, what's the minimum allowable width of the cross section, all right? Because if you know the width of this and I know that I'm putting three bars in here and I know that I have a stirrup coming around and I know I have a gap distance and cover, you can start adding up all of these pieces, right? I can add up the cover, I can add up the diameter of the stirrup, I can add up the gap, I can add up, you know, the spacing between the centers of centers of these bars as I lay them in, so forth, and I can figure out what does this minimum have to be to be able to get all of that stuff in into there. Okay. And so that will be one of the checks that you can kind of start to work work out for that. All right, so that kind of starts to become some of our details, some of our detailing for us there. So anyway, um, I'll leave that kind of as just a part of our practical considerations scenario that we're looking at. Okay. All right. So now to kind of switch gears a little bit, the last half of this video lecture, we're going to kind of talk about, you know, kind of a rehash of the Whitney block and kind of the, the types of problems that we have in analysis and design for Flexure. And again, we're limiting our discussion to SRR. Okay, so this is our strain diagram that we've talked about previously. Okay, I have some applied moment to this cross section. I have a singly reinforced area of steel. Strain diagram is just as we've always seen at 0 0.003 at the top. Okay, and I want epsilon s greater than epsilon y at this location, and I want that to be desired to be greater than 0 0.005 because this leads me back to phi of 0 0.9, which is a good thing. Okay. From there, we could build our Whitney block. That's just the classic Whitney that we've done all along, okay? And so if you look at all the stuff that we have in defining the stress and the strain and the, the beam itself, there's a whole bunch of variables that live, that list in this, okay? So we've got B, the width of the beam, the depth of the beam, the area of steel, the applied moment, the depth of the stress block, 
F, Y, and F, C defined. If I knew every one of those things, I would know everything about this picture. In design, we kind of group things on what do we know. Now, again, sometimes though, I know A, S, B, and D, or I know row. That's the same, the same set of the trio, okay? And then most of the time, F, Y, and F prime C are given. I know the strength of the concrete I'm going to use, and I know the strength of steel that I'm going to use accordingly. So when we do that, we kind of, kind of break up our analysis into um, three basic different categories, okay? The first category is the analysis, right? And basically, that's the scenario that we've worked whereby I'm given the beam dimensions, B and D, and I know the area of steel, the unknowns out of that list then are M, U, and A. Okay. Now, starting with the ACI 318.14 and including 318.19, phi is also now a variable, but we don't put that on our list because I can make some assumptions based on those, those row minimums and those row balances uh, values that can get me pretty close most of the time on those. Most of the time we assume it's 0.9 and then we verify it at the end. So that's why he's not on the list because you've got to kind of deal with him in, in his own right. Okay, so the analysis case, that's our definition of the analysis case. I know B, I know D, I know AS, but I don't know the other stuff. Okay, I'm going to define a category for design. One is being given that I know the applied moment and I know the dimensions of the beam. What's my area of steel? Okay, and again, by, you know, by association, what's the, the depth of that stress block, okay? And then a design two situation occurs when all I know is the moment, okay? And now I gotta figure out what's my B, what's my D, and then what's my area of steel to be able to, to work this, okay? In this case, when that happens, okay, typically you make an assumption on row and you make an assumption about the ratio of depth to B, okay? And a lot of times we'll say that D is equal to two times B or D is equal to three times B, depending on, on your application that you're looking at. But you make some sort of assumption that will let us put all that together to be able to then solve for stuff. Okay, now, the tools that we have at our disposal, if you remember the procedure for analyzing the Whitney block. Oh, there, got kind of a weird glare on there. Sorry about that. Okay, is that I can always do sum of forces in the X direction. I can sum moments about the compressive resultant, I can sum moments about the tensile resultant, okay? And that's how we got our moment capacity. So I can either sum moments here about the compression, sum here around the tension, and then I can always sum forces in the X. Okay, so those are the only tools that we have, okay? But really, there are only two independent equations in this because this, this equation and this one are kind of doing the same thing for us, okay? Um, we also have compatibility, okay, which is kind of relating values from one region to another, and that is the balance condition. And this is where that balance condition that we talked about last time comes in really, really handy. Okay, again, we don't use it so much in the modern days, but back in, back in the old days, you know, when I walked uphill both ways or whatever the saying, you know, used to be, we can come in and we can figure out what my row balance is, and then I can turn around and use that to figure out what's my A balance and what's my C balance. Again, this is the depth of the balance Whitney block, and this is the depth of the neutral axis of a balance strain diagram. Okay, and so what we do is if I'm doing an analysis problem, I can check that rho is less than or equal to some rho max of 0 0.5 times rho balance. And again, this is that rule of thumb that we kind of played with last time, okay? In design, I need to check that mu is less than or equal to phi mn, or check that a is less than a max equal to approximately 0.5 a balance, okay? And so that's kind of some scenarios, and again, the relationship between A balance and C balance is that beta one that we talked about in the Whitney diagram. So it's still very, very similar. So let's go through, the analysis is pretty straightforward. We've done that one several times now, but it's the design ones that we wanna kind of talk about how do we start to solve this methodology, all right? So for design one, okay, basically this is the scenario when B and H are known or B and D are known and the cover is known. Okay, we have a statement of the problem that says we are given MU, B and D, and we don't know A and AS. Okay, the tools that we have is the sum of forces equal to zero. So this one, ASFY, is equal to 0.85 F prime CBA. Okay, and then the moment MU, is, uh, which is basically we're setting it equal to phi MN, okay, is going to be equal to phi times ASFY times D minus A over 2. Okay, what we can do is we can solve these equations simultaneously. Okay, that if I know MU, okay, then I can solve for AS to get pull off what my AS value here is. 
And so that's all we're going to do. So A is this expression, MU is this one. Okay, but we should point out that D should be calculated generally as H minus two and a half inches. Okay, and for, for what happens for, for one layer of steel, and then we're going to take D as being H minus three and a half inches for two. Because remember, as we were talking about, there's a lot more going on than just bar to distance. You know, to be, get all the spacings of those cover requirements, I have my, my longitudinal AS value, I have my stirrup, here and then I pick up my cover here. Okay, typically all of this stuff and the distance to the center of the bar for single layer is somewhere around two, two and a half inches. So that's why I choose two and a half to be able to kind of make an assumption on D. Okay, likewise H, you know, when I go add a second layer, if I assume that these are one inch plus some extra distance apart, I basically in effect add an inch to that calculation as well. Okay, all right, so here's the design approach that we're gonna do for this. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to compute the dead load and the self-weight of the beam. Okay, you know the dimensions. We know that gamma for concrete is 150 pounds per cubic foot, so I can figure out what my dead load is on a per foot basis as a PLF number. I can figure that out for him. Okay, we can compute the required strength, okay, which is our factored moment on here, doing, making it approximately equal to 1.2 times the dead load moment plus 1.6 times the live load moment. And again, that's where the self-weight becomes an issue. Is that I get a little bit of extra factoring in there. And that, that guy is not insignificant. He can add several percent to, to your overall moment. Okay, and so what we do then is once you've got your factored load, I turn around and I solve for the amount of required tensile steel. Oh, yes, okay. And so we're going to assume phi is 0 0.9. And then basically I'm going to plug all this stuff in. And this is that manipulation where I plug in the A equation that I had here, plug it in for A here down here, all right? And so this, this is just D minus A over two is all this ends up being, all right? And so when I do this, again, we said that this was quadratic in AS, I can solve for AS, okay? All right, so once you choose your bar sizes, then you can compute row actual, okay? Do this to be able to get to AS actual. You know, we talked about this being 2.9 inches squared, but I actually put in 3.0 because of the way the bar sizes work out. Okay, use this number to compute row actual, where that's AS actual over B times D. That gives me my row actual. And then I can go in and I can compute my row minimum and my row balance, or if you want to compute row of 0 0.005, that's fine as well. Okay, and so here's the, the logic that you have to check. If my row minimum is less than what I actually put in, and what I actually put in is less than this row of 0 0.005, then phi is 0 0.9 is confirmed. Okay, we've met the requirements to be able to, to get this. So we have a lower row value that our strain will be great, strain in our steel will be greater than that, that 0 0.005 limit. Okay, if we find out that row actual is less than row minimum, what you want to do is typically you increase the AS. Okay, okay. And the reason that, you know, is kind of a first pass design kind of thing, you could also increase B and D like we talked about, but that's going to require you to recalculate all of those previous steps. So most often I just bump the steel up to the minimum limit. Okay. If you find out that your row actual is greater than this row of 0 0.005 formula, then what happens is your fee is no longer 0 0.9. You've got to recompute fee and then you have to go back and start to choose that. Okay. All right. Now, so... Um, for the final selection of our size and our quantity of our bars, though, the, from here on, the methodology for de our design case number one is going to follow the exact same steps as what I'm going to show you in steps 7 through 15 over in the design method number two. So I'm going to switch over and do design method two, and then when we get to step seven, that set of steps is common to everybody. Okay, once you've made your selections, and now we start verifying some things. All right, so let's do design case number two real quick. Okay, and this is the case where um, when B and H are unknown, okay, I don't know the dimensions of the beam, okay. So our statement of the problem is that I'm given the moment and I don't know A, I don't know the width, I don't know the depth, and I don't know the steel. Where do we even start? Okay, so the tools that we have to work with are, again, sum of forces X sum of for and the sum of the moments. Those are the same two equations. Those don't change. It's just two independent equations, okay. So there are two independent equations to solve for four unknowns. Okay, so that means that we have a problem, right? 
um, that you know, two unknowns we have to assume. Okay, so what we're going to do, kind of similar to last time, is I'm going to show you what it is that we're going to check. Okay, so we're going to estimate the dead load of the beam again. Okay, and so we can do this, you know, one of two ways. I can estimate the weight of the beam as being 10 to 20% of the load that it must carry. Okay, so I can take whatever I know is my applied load and I can add another 10% or another 20%. And again, it kind of depends. This is, I mean, this is kind of a rough guess, really, that I basically artificially inflate the applied moment to account for the weight of the member himself and the stresses that his self-weight will in, in, you know, impact on him. Okay, and then alternatively, okay, I could also estimate H as being roughly 8 to 10% of the span and B being half of the height and then compute the weight that way. Okay, and this one's probably a little bit simpler, a little bit more straightforward on this. Uh, there's some, reason, some reasons that we won't go into here about why I can do this provision. It has to do with uh, like you no know, slab thickness requirements and those kind of things that we can kind of start playing with, you know, some, some moment coefficients and stuff. But again, why we do this is kind of, we won't talk about here, but this is a method that works very, very well. So I'm more into the procedure of what we're doing than I am maybe the why of why they chose these particular values. Again, these are a lot of rules of thumb as well. You won't find these in the ACI code. It's just kind of how do I tackle a problem when I do it. Okay, all right. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute the required strength, factor our moment, just like we did before. Okay, and so what we're going to do then is we're going to assume the amount of reinforcement that I'm going to put in this beam. That's kind of a, a quick guess. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a trial steel ratio rho that's somewhere between my rho min and a rho max value of 0.5 rho b. Now again, this was a provision from the old ACI codes, okay? There is no requirement on rho max in the current, in the current versions, okay? So, so what I want to do is, you know, find my balance, take half of it. That will almost, um, it's a very economical choice when we do that based on experience, and based on the provisions that have changed here in recent years. Okay, so rho min, very, very simple, is the smaller of that inequality, three root f prime c f y b w d, okay, and 200 over, um, 200 over f y. Now, actually, since we're dealing with rows, the b w d isn't there, okay? It's just three root f prime c over f y to get us to rho, okay? All right, and that, this again comes out of provision 9.6.1.2 of ACI. Okay, I gave you guys the formula for the row balanced. That's 0.85 beta 1 F prime C F Y, and then this ratio of strains. Okay, um, you can also set, you know, as a limit that row max is equal to row of 0 0.005. And what happens is then if I choose a row less than this, I'm guaranteed to get a strain higher than this. So that's another alternative to playing this 0.5 row balance game that we have. Okay, so that's kind of a little little trick that we could do if we wanted to. All right, once you've got that, then we can go in and we can look at ah, get my page over there. Um, we can start playing with the R tables. Okay, and so so we've chosen a row. Okay, and so I can compute the quantity BD squared required. You know, by taking and kind of rearranging things a little bit and solving for you know, all of the parts that we have. So if we go through, I can write A as this modified formula, rho Fy times D over 0.85 F prime C. Okay, rho we know is ASBD. Okay, and then I know my moment equation. And again, we're assuming phi of 0.9 because we're going to cap it, cap that maximum rho value. My moment equation looks something like this. And then I can substitute all of this stuff in and I get a big monster equation that looks something kind of like that. Okay, for my moment. All right, and so what I can do then is I can then turn around and I can solve for BD squared, okay? And I can factor all that stuff out because now everything is known. You know Fy, I know rho, I know F prime C, and I know my applied moment, and I know the phi that I'm guessing is going to be right. And so when I do that, I can do these R tables and kind of rearrange things and back solve for BD squared, okay? And then I can, you know, you know either use this equation or just find the value of R from the tables is another way, okay? And it's basically solve for BD squared out of that for a given row, okay? Once you do that, then we select B and D. Okay, so if my B and D, my BD squared that I selected is about the same as my BD squared that was calculated, okay? And then if my H is greater than my H min for deflections, okay, and again, this H min comes out of another ACI table of 9.3.1.1 that basically says that for a minimum thickness 
Um, um, for a simply supported case, I'm going to take the, the minimum H as being L over 16. L is the span of the beam. One end continuous, L is eight, over 18 and a half. Both ends are continuous. L is um, L over 21. And if it's a cantilever, it's L over 8. All of these will get me a guess on H. Okay, and then if I know H, okay, then I can turn around and I can find my D by those rules of thumb that I told you. Okay, so again, I said that, you know, take H should be calculated as D plus two and a half inches for one layer of steel and D plus three and a half inches for two layers of steel. Okay, if you get into more layers of steel than that, then it's a little bit more complex problem anyway. And so these rules of thumb don't do a whole lot for you. But now I've got two relationships that will get me to this. Now, once you solve for B and D out of that formula, Okay, we're going to round off our dimensions uh, to aid in the construction of the forms and so on. So normally, you know, if you find out that B is you know, 12.9 inches and D is 14.3 inches, I'm generally going 13 by 15. All right, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, my video just cut off. So I um, apologize. So let's uh, kind of rehash, you know, we were talking about our dimensions B and D. So if I had a 12.9 inch dimension and a 14.3 inch dimension, normally I'm gonna round that up to some more convenient value. Um, it helps with the construction of the forms. Um, contractors generally don't like it when you go to something non-standard or you have some without a very good reason for it. And particularly contractors that choose to use metal forms, they don't like it when you start drilling holes or making alter, alternations to their, you know, their, their standard setup. Now if it's a plywood form setup, it's a hassle, but it's a little bit more forgivable, but typically we try to kind of help the guys out in the field, so to say. All right, um, when I make my, my selection of B and D, I try to keep a ratio of D and B somewhere between one and a half and three. Now, obviously, my example doesn't fit that, but in practice, I'm looking for something in that range. Um, 2.0 seems like a pretty convenient value, so it's um, that one will give you an economic section. Your area of steel won't be too outrageous for, for that um, generally speaking, so that's kind of how we start to choose our B's and our D's for this. Okay, once you have B and D selected, okay, now I can compute the required area of steel. And I'll have my area of steel associated with the row that we chose artificially multiplied by B and D. And now we're up to step seven. Now, if you recall, you know, in the video before that, this is where both methods, design one and design two, will start to follow through. So I'm going to run through these. These, these thoughts real quick for us and then we'll uh, we'll call it a day after that but if we look at the next step is then is that we're going to select the size and number of bars that we need kind of a breakdown okay kind of as a preliminary guess this is the layout portion i've got an area of steel now how do i associate it and you know how do i lay it out in such a way to be able to meet all the other requirements for cover and strain and everything else that we must check all right so what we're going to do is we're going to select the size and the number of bars such that the total of all bars is equal or a little bit larger than calculated AS. Now, don't go ridiculously over this number, okay? Because if you do, uh, you may end up hosing your epsilon T value, right? And dropping it from, from below this limit of 0 0.005. And if I do that, then that screws up my fee and then that screws up everything that I've just done. Okay, so you wanna try to get as close to that as you can without, you know, you know generally a uniform bar size or maybe two different sizes in the, in the pattern is okay. But don't have, you know, one number three and a number five and a number seven and a number eight all in the same section just because you're trying to hit that. Don't do that to the people, all right? Because that's got some problems with it too. Um, I'll leave that for construction management or a conversation with the, the site foreman when he, when he sees that on your drawings. Um, let's, yeah, let's just not do that. Okay, now the things that we want to remember when you select your bars, we want to respect the following. We want to minimize the placement cost by choosing larger bars if possible, right? If I go with, you know, I need 20 number three bars, well, that's 20 bars that have to be physically tied in and transported to the site, okay? So we want to try to avoid, you know, sizes that go larger than number 10 for weight reasons. But, you know, we also want to avoid going too small because now you've got a ridiculous amount. And that will also affect the number of layers and their minimum widths and all sorts of other things that will happen as well. Okay. Um, now, that being said, there is benefit to using smaller bars. And this will be in with, the, with determining crack widths. Now, we haven't talked about that yet. This will be a later video when we get into serviceability and, and crack width requirements. Okay, that I can control crack widths better with smaller bars than I can with, you know, fewer, bigger bars. Okay, now we also want to avoid having to spec out number 14s or number 18s just because they weigh so much and they're harder to place. And then the anchorage requirements on those 
are also a major issue. So there's kind of this, you know, there's this sweet spot that's kind of in the middle for flexural members. You know, I like to kind of think of it as being like, you know, six, sevens, eights, nines aren't bad. Tens are about the upper that I will go to. Okay, anything over that, I'm thinking, of, you know, my section is either too small or my dimensions are bad. We've got to do something different to kind of, kind of make it a little bit more optimal. So these are all thoughts that are kind of happening in the back of my mind as I'm looking for this. Okay, now after you select your bars, you're going to check your steel arrangement can it fit according to the dimensions B and D that you chose. Okay, so now earlier, which was you know back in step one, is my B large enough to accommodate? all of those bars and the spacings and the cover and the stirrup distance, kind of like what we talked about in the first half of this video. Okay. And also then did you end up with one layer? Could you get it all in one layer, which is generally ideal, or do you have to somehow come up with multiple layers of steel as assumed? Okay. Okay. Now if the dimensions that you, uh, that you chose for B and D chosen back in step five, do not agree with your bar arrangement, then you need to change your B and D accordingly, and then you have to repeat all of these other steps for, for, for the area. Basically, if you can't get your bars in in two layers or less, then you violated one of your assumptions. You need to kind of rearrange your beam size and or redo the calculations to take that into account. But most of the time, you can accomplish what you're wanting to do in those standard situations accordingly. Okay, all right. Step number eight, then, is that we're going to then check the dead load and revise MU. Now, again, without knowing the beam dimensions, you know, I can't possibly compute the dead load, but in our design two methodology, we took a guess and gave ourselves somewhere between 10 and 20% extra load to account for that extra weight. Okay. And so this, that's kind of the protection or the shield for you on knowing that step eight was coming, that you bump up early on to choose a size and so that you're okay. And so that's why we did that. Okay. So we compute the new dead load according to our selected B and H, and then we recompute the new MU value. And so if MU is about the same as it was or is over what you what the new one is, then you're done. Okay, but if it's, you know, with this step, you still need to go through and do some of the other checks. But if it ends up being significantly higher, then you need to revise the section and come back through the process again. Okay, now, finally, we can compute the final area of reinforcement AS based off of these new dimensions, okay? And at this stage, you have B and H, and the design basically becomes a design one problem once you have B and H. So this whole process is all about coming up with a strategy to get you to B and H and coming up with some rules of thumbs or some estimates or, or guesses to be able to do it. It's a long process. It is. I admit it. Okay. So once we're at design one, then you're back to basically solve for A and AS simultaneously. We've done that. Um, what you'll find is that your AS won't change much from what you computed back on step six. It might tweak a little bit, but again, you had a specific AS required that you calculated, but then you always gave a little bit more when you actually selected your bars, right? That, that was... That was the 1.9 versus the 2.0 scenario that we described earlier. Okay, so so generally AS at this point doesn't change a whole lot. Now, if you cut it too close, sometimes you can get burned here as well. That's why I say give yourself a little bit of extra extra room to to, to wiggle or to grow into, so to say. Okay, once I've got that final AS, then I can select the size and the number of bars. This is our final selection, um, which means then I can compute my selected AS and my row again. And then basically we take this new row and I check it against row min and I check it against row of 0 0.005. If my row is in this range, we're okay with V of 0.9. If not, now you've got to calculate epsilon T at the outermost tensile steel and then revise that reduction factor. And then when that happens, it means back to step four. You go all the way back to the beginning. All right, so that's why you know, we're trying to trying to hit this range and we've made some assumptions to help us try to improve our odds of hitting this range for a problem that we may not necessarily know. Okay, so once, you, once you've found this, then I can calculate my nominal moment and my design moment, okay, because I know phi and then my mn is just asfy d minus a over two. You can find a, you know as, and this just basically comes into being an analysis problem. Check that this capacity is greater than mu. Uh, make sure that you're not too drastically, you know, oversized, you know, 10, 15% isn't a problem. If you're double or triple what you actually need, you've been a little too conservative on your assumptions, and it's probably worth your while to go back and try to refine it a little bit. Okay. Finally, the last step, and we can't do a lot here, is that we want to check the serviceability. Okay. And so at this stage, the things that you have is you have the width, you have the depth, you have the area of steel, you know your dead load, you know your live load. So serviceability can be checked at this time. Again, we'll have a video on that coming up. Okay. 
we can compute our service moment, which is just m dead plus m live. Okay, we can compute our cross-sectional moments of inertia for the gross section and for the crack section. Uh, we can then check stresses and strains. We can check our crack control width criteria. And then finally, we can come in and we can check that we don't have a problem with a long and short-term def short deflections. Short-term being the instant deflections and long-term being things like deflections due to creep and shrinkage and those kind of things. We'll talk about this more in a later lesson. So I know this was a really, really long scenario, but it's kind of, again, everything that's you know running through your mind as you're designing a beam and the factors that you have to do and the decisions that you make make this a whole lot more complicated than what you saw back in a SEAL design class. right? I'm convinced that the person that said the death is in the details, he was a concrete designer, right? Because it's just so many little things. And if you make an assumption or you size something wrong, that there can be a problem or, you know, an error that pops up way down in one of these later steps that sends you all the way racing back to the, to the end or back to the beginning to, to start over. Um, it's also a reason why I think concrete design problems lend themselves very nicely to, to setting up some sort of table or some sort of Excel spreadsheet or something because then I can start tweaking things and I can tally all of this stuff just by creating some numbers. And so this becomes a very handy kind of general formulation to be able to work out and figure out do I have a problem or do I not. And so spreadsheeting on concrete design problems, I mean, it's, a, it's, that's just a, it's just an awesome way to do stuff and I strongly encourage you to do it. Once you make the tool, then it becomes reusable if you do it right. And so you know, I've got a tool I've been using for years that um, does just that. So it's very handy to be able to throw in information in a hurry and get to that. So anyway, I apologize for the length. I apologize for the our little um, video snafu there about 10 minutes ago. Um, but hopefully it didn't detract from the message that we were trying to get across. As always, you know, take a look at the, the comments. Please uh, leave us some feedback. Let us know what we can do differently. And as always, like the video if you liked it. And be sure to subscribe to our channel. So... Uh, thank you for bearing with me. Um, have a great evening, and we'll talk to you all next time. Happy engineering.